Hey everybody, this is Brennan Hauser with Evoke Bike. We have the champ in the building on the podcast, Sean Quinn, US Pro, road race champion from this year on EF. He goes in on the nitty gritty of his training. What is he doing for VO2 Max training? On the other side, what has he messed up in his training? And his coach is Nate Wilson, who's been on the podcast. We talk about fatigue resistance, climbing out of mental holes when even riders at his level that are so good say to themselves, maybe I'm not that good. Maybe I kind of suck at this. And then a big word came up at the end, momentum, and what that means to your training. Sean, thank you so much for taking the time to do this podcast. He just came off the Dauphiné. We have fingers crossed that he gets on the team selected for the big race this year in July. And to the new YouTube subs, we have a few of you guys, the OGs, Taylor, Herb, Gordon, Martin. Thanks, guys, for subscribing to the channel. They get all the videos right when we post them, probably three to four weeks beforehand. A few others of you are trickling in, and we appreciate the support. Good luck with your training and racing, and we'll talk to you soon. See ya. Hey, what's up, everybody? Before we jump into the podcast, I want to talk about selling a bike online, which I hate doing, but Will had a bunch of bikes to sell, and he tried this new platform, Bicycle, which I'm sure you've heard advertisements for on other websites and podcasts, and it's the B-U-Y-C-Y-C-L-E.com. So I had Chris's road bike to sell, and I haven't sold it because I hate finding a box. I hate going to the bike shop to get the empty boxes, and then you have to put it on you know, a marketplace or something, and you get all these trolley comments, and it's just sort of a hassle, and I felt kind of lazy about it. So I tried it, and they said, hey, we heard you had this podcast. Will you Do you want to promote this? I said, let me try the platform first and see if this is as easy as it looks, and you got to give my listeners something. And so if you have a bike to sell, 0% seller fee, so you get all the cash. This is amazing. And you just go online, make your bicycle platform, take some specific pictures, you get offers for your bike, and the bike will be sold. They have over 20,000 pre-owned and refurbished road, gravel, mountain, triathlon bikes. So if you're looking for a bike, this is a great place to go to. And it cre- it uh, connects people on a global scale. It's not just in your local market. And if you're selling the bike, you don't pay for shipping. You also get the box and all the materials to ship it sent to you so it's picked up it's super convenient and the other nice thing if you are a buyer there's guaranteed buyer protection secure payments simple shipping when it arrives to you and there's actually customer service so if there's a problem on either end there's someone that you can reach out to and you're not hoping that someone sends you the bike you're not venmoing to a random account and i've always hated buying or selling that way it's just it some go well, some go very poorly. So if you use the code evoq.bike, you get 0% seller fee. List your bike, see what happens. It's better than sitting in the garage, which is what mine was doing. And I just basically got a free wheel set. So thanks, Bicycle. See you guys. Enjoy the podcast. Thanks so much for making the time to do this, man. This is going to be awesome. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm a, I'm a fan of the blog now, so I've listened to a couple. Um, a couple. So it's Awesome. It's- Great, great to hear. Hopefully we're continuing to get better. We're getting rippers like yourself on, which is invaluable to everybody. So with that, man, let's jump into it. Let's for the few people that might not know who you are, who's Sean Quinn? Um, I guess I'm just a a guy, 24 years old from uh, Los Angeles, California. And uh, yeah, I started racing, racing bikes at a pretty young age. Um, I got really into the Tour de France when I was a kid and so yeah I worked my way up through the ranks as quickly as I could and uh now I'm a professional so that's my job and then yeah I I enjoy you know just hanging out with friends and making music and traveling and yeah I live in Nice and France now part of the year also still spend some time in LA and then I also live part time in Denver, Colorado when I'm in the States. So awesome. I have a question on when you said move through the ranks as quickly as you could. I hear some people say go as fast as you can so that you're racing the best people, the people that are faster than you. Other people say, ah, slow down a little bit, win, make sure you're winning. For the amateurs listening, what's your guiding light in that just go as fast as possible what are like the criteria of when you're upgrading let's say there's somebody who wants to get to be a domestic pro i guess i didn't go as quickly i could have there's some steps i could have gone a bit 
uh, faster on. Like um, when I was a U23, I was pretty successful in my first year and I, I had the opportunity to turn pro, but I hadn't, I hadn't won any races and I wasn't in my, yeah, it was clear. I wasn't one of the best guys in the world. And like, I really wanted to win the baby Giro. So I spent, mm -hmm. I stayed three years as a U23. Um, and I think that helped me like, well, I can't even imagine where I would have been if I had dog pro when I was 19 years old, still like I would have gotten my teeth even more kicked in than I did. Um, so there's definitely some value in, uh, taking your time. Yeah, I totally agree. You need to learn how to win bike races. At maybe not each level, but at some level, at some point you have to learn. Um, and I think it's also a lot more fun. Um, you see a lot of juniors jumping straight into the world tour now. I can't, I, I can't imagine doing that because like it is, it is a crazy jump in the level and yeah, I, I just think it's more fun if you're competitive than if you're racing for like. 50th place or just pulling on the front all day uh mm -hmm. some people might disagree and they just want to be in that echelon and uh yeah consider themselves one of the best but um i think winning races is probably a lot more fun for almost everyone do you remember anything from that little block of staying u23 things you absorbed or that were specifically learning that maybe still stick with you yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is <clears throat> I wanted to only do one more year, but then it was COVID. So I really only got like mm. 10, 20 races. And then, uh, so I ended up staying two more years. But yeah, I think the main thing is just physical development. I don't think I was ready to turn pro. Um, I didn't, I didn't take myself super professionally either. I was still like uh, going to college in the fall, um, at least those first two years. And, there were like, in my opinion, I was trying pretty hard and doing everything right. But when I look back, it's like, yeah, there was a lot of knowledge I accumulated over those two years that I needed. But I think yeah, I still, I wouldn't say I wasn't ready to turn pro, but I learned so much in my first year. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, a crazy amount. So just how to race or just this maturing or... I'm just really yeah, curious. More, more a lot. I just, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think it's really easy when you're a junior and a U23, you're one of the best. So you're, yeah, like always racing for yourself um, or not always, but a lot of the time racing for yourself and uh, it's kind of easy. Everything just falls into place. And then you turn pro and all of a sudden you're like, wow, these are like not just the 10 best guys from each age group. These are like those guys times 20 age groups. So it's like, there are all these guys you forgot about who were the year ahead of you, U23, who just are so good, but you haven't heard their name because they're not whatever winning grand tours. And all of a sudden you think everyone at some point in their world tour career, like they get to a race where they just get completely smashed in the first year. And then they're like, what am I doing here? Like, and I, I think everyone probably gets that imposter syndrome at some point. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I forgot what the question was. But. No, no, it's good. It's good. I, I like where you're just flowing with it. You brought up college for a year and I was reading on, I think on the EF website, you had studied business and I was wondering, is there anything from going to college that you've been able to apply to racing or just to life in that uh, year you were there? Yeah, to be honest, I mean, academically, like I went to a college prep school in LA and it was uh, 10 times more rigorous than uh, i went to see boulder for mm. yeah business and so i didn't i really don't think i gained a lot from going to school like in terms of academics because you're just in your first year i did two semesters so really it's like just starting a level classes and um yeah you I, I didn't soak up a lot that i take into my life now but what i did gain was like the social aspects and and that changed my life forever i met so many people there that yeah we'll be friends forever and um yeah it's just just that independence 
liked because I, I, I considered not going to college, um, because yeah, I, I knew I was good enough to turn pro and it was like, I'm going to go to a really good U23 team. I could just stay at home and train basically. And I really considered doing that. Like even two weeks before starting at CU, I was like still on the fence. Like, oh, am I really going to go do this? And then, uh, yeah, I, but I can't imagine my life without it. So what pushed you to the yes of saying, yeah, I'm going to go. Yeah, I think it was just, I was in that situation where like, you know, I've been, I went to sit like my high school and middle school were connected. So like I've been hanging out with the same friends for six years. I mean, I, I met a lot of people through cycling, but, um, I don't know. I just felt like there's gotta be more to life than like, I wanted, you know, something new. Mm. And yeah, I, I, like I said, when I, when I was considering it, I was like, ah, like I'll go on. I'm, I'm not, my expectations are pretty low, but yeah, maybe the best decision I've ever made. So cool. So you just finished the Dauphiné. What's, what's uh, going on for you right now in France? What's next? What do you see on the next couple months? If you know yet from the team? Yeah, that's the thing. It's kind of a mystery because I'm going for a tour selection. So, uh, yeah, obviously I hope to be in Florence end of June, but, um, it's not really up to me. I've done what I can do at this point. And now I just, yeah, take a few, few easy days. I mean, definitely I finished yesterday. So two, three mm -hmm. days easy. And then I'll go up to altitude for like two, two more weeks and then yeah, hope for the best. I mean, at this point, it's pretty much out of my hands, right? I can do, like, I'm going to do everything I can to be prepared for that race, but mm -hmm. um, the actual selection is up to the directors and the strategy they want to go with. So when you're talking about like time in between races, I think it was maybe when you did the Vuelta last year, it was probably 10 days before that. I think uh, Burgos finished, if I have the timeline correct. What do you do in that? Say you have a 10 days, you know, you just raced a week. You're about to go into three weeks of racing, which was your first grand tour. Do you remember what you did just in between? I'm just curious on like sessions or your mindset. Yeah, actually Burgos, I think was really close to the Vuelta. Like, okay. Normally I think if you do Swiss, you have like 10 days to the tour or something, but Burgos, I think I only had like five days. Okay. So I really didn't do anything. I just like rode an hour for four days and I, I think I had one VO2 session. Okay. And that was really it. Um I think it depends on the gap. Like a lot of the guys who are doing the tour, so they were at altitude all the way till the Dauphin and now they go back for whatever, two, two and a half weeks. Um but yeah I think if, if you don't recover properly from the race, like th the racing gives you so much in terms of like, uh, yeah, physical adaptation that as long as you just, uh, recover properly from that, you're going to be in good shape two weeks, mm. two weeks from now. And I think, yeah, a lot of guys, they just want to stay healthy and then they'll be, they'll be in good shape. Yeah, there's a good article. I'll post a link to it that EF, I forgot to look who was interviewing you, but uh, you were talking about the Vuelta and just the physical tiredness also seeping into the mental side of things. Can you talk about that a little bit? You had mentioned that, is it just feeling lackadaisical or is it like you're a little depressed and like, what am I doing here? How does that feel as you're going through three weeks of insane racing? Yeah, so the the only grand tour I've done so far is that vault the last year. And that was uh pretty hard. I'd say more more mentally than physically because um I mean it's not like I was racing super hard every day. I was going in a group pedal a lot because if you miss the break and uh I think about like day twelve or something, our G C guy had uh yeah, he faltered a little bit and so yeah, basically it was like all in for the break. And then if not, then you just go on the groupetto for three hours or like wait for the groupetto for three hours. And uh, yeah, so physically it probably wasn't super hard, but to me that was so hard mentally, like not 
not racing every day kind of and you you're you're feeling tired the weather was not it was not like spanish summer it was mm. it was pretty grim and uh yeah it's also just knowing or not knowing thinking yeah i'm i'm not uh at the physical level i need to be like halfway through that well i remember i had a call with my coach and i was like already really thinking about yeah what i need to do differently in training because i was like i wouldn't say i was checked out and i, I still gave my best in the last week of that race but it was like yeah i'm not at the physical level i need to be to compete here so what was that conversation like what did you draw from that what were some of the things like okay this is what you probably need to work on for next time yeah i mean a lot of it comes down to like me messing up my training and like not doing things properly sometimes um and at that point at last year at the well that i remember really thinking like i really need to get lighter like that that will answer all my problems and of course it doesn't by itself but um that is that is one one area that i i didn't need to improve on i think but um i was super obsessive about it i was like this is what i need to do this off season is just get lighter which i have gone through iterations of that uh, idea and obsession multiple times um but i've done it i've done it the wrong way so many times that and even before the wealth of last year i tried to get really light by like yeah doing stupid stuff and just eating at the wrong times or not eating at the wrong times and uh mm. I think, yeah, that cost me. But um, at the end of the day, it's like it was my first grand tour, and I kind of just needed to rip the bandaid off and uh, get it, get it over with. Obviously, it would have been nice to actually do something there and not just be like pack filled. But uh, yeah, I think it, I got a big adaptation from doing those three weeks. And it, so you mentioned eating at the wrong times or like maybe not eating. Um, were there any other tips you could give to people listening? Because this is obviously a huge thing in cycling. Get as light as possible. Any other things you're like, man, I wish I had done this differently in terms of the weight loss? Yeah, I think the main thing is timing of eating. I think people just think like, okay, you need the deficit. And I would argue that the easiest way to do the deficit is like, eat a big breakfast, go out and ride. And then when you're done riding, just try not to eat the rest of the day. And cause it's like the easiest in terms of like, how to you know, mm -hmm. at least that's what I found, but that is the absolute worst thing you can possibly do. Like you need to replace the glycogen. Your biggest meal should be right after the ride, I would mm -hmm. say. And you don't want to skimp on dinner either. If anything, like you want to have a smaller breakfast to be honest, but to be honest, it's, it's really like, you can't skip anywhere if you're gonna if you're gonna train properly and uh i think that's the biggest thing like if you're doing six watts per kilo like if you lose a kilogram like that's only six watts difference and like losing a kilogram can it can like <laughs> ruin your you ruin you for weeks if you do it the wrong way whereas like six watts that's like nothing you know mm -hmm. it's it's crazy so I think a, a lot of guys, it's like, yeah, they're trying to force force their body to change. Yeah, at the end of the day, like you, you were born meant to be a certain height, meant to be a certain build, and you just gotta accept that and try and you know be as strong as you can. And uh, I, I've seen a, a lot of guys go through the same thing because I I've been I've made all the mistakes you can make with this like. Um, fasting and stuff, stupid stuff like that. But the only time I've seen success is like doing it in extreme moderation, basically not, not cutting severely anywhere, just doing it for a long time. I, I like that extreme moderation is don't go too crazy, but yeah. Well, even Vodder said about you, you know, Hey, Sean's a great climber, but he's not super frail and skinny and he can actually still hammer it on the flats. So you know, embrace that. And that's, as you said, that's how you're built. That's who you are. So keep ripping mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. What's let's, uh, let's jump back to spring because I think, you know, you broke the sternum, had a concussion. And I think 
curious how you mentally handled that. Was that you, you were still able to train, I read. Um, so maybe that helped, but you weren't able to go to the Giro. What, do you have any tips for like coming back to fitness or did you feel like you didn't lose much fitness since you still got to ride or how, how was that for you in that period? Yeah, to be honest, it wasn't so hard. I think, I think I handled it pretty well. I'd say, um, I don't know. I had a, I had a really tough spring, uh, mentally. I, I think that I was not really performing great in the races and I didn't feel like I was, I don't know. I ju- it just didn't feel great. And, uh, I was a little nervous going into the Jura, like even at Basque country, there were a couple of stages I probably should have been competitive in and I just like, wasn't quite there. And, um, yeah, so I honestly, when I crashed, it was like, okay, Jura is out of the question, but it's like immediately I was like, okay, but now the tour is maybe an option. So that was extremely motivating. Um, and yeah, I was super lucky with the concussion because that's, that's always been one of my biggest fears is like getting, I don't know, CTE or mm-hmm. uh, yeah, messing with my brain. And, um, at first I was a little worried, uh, but after a week I was totally fine. So yeah, the sternum I could train on, I just couldn't crash again. So that's why I wasn't racing. Um, and I only ended up taking a week off the bike completely. So really that's uh that's almost nothing Um, yeah but yeah i think having having a goal to come back to is is a massive thing like basically right when i crashed it was like okay i have whatever two months obviously i don't want to rush it but it's like yeah i want to be want to be ready for the dauphiné um at the same time i was prepared to like not race for the rest of the year if i had head trauma or something um but yeah that that's that's mainly what it is i had to see the physio a lot um but that was 100 percent worth it and yeah i I feel like uh yeah i didn't have the best open day but for sure um i'm in a pretty good place compared to the last few years Cool. So you went then to nationals, obviously won the American championship, which is incredible, but that was your first race then in two months. What did, did you do anything? You made the comment earlier, you know, racing gives you so much for anyone that hasn't watched the finish of that road race. I mean, you and Nielsen versus Brandon is like just the haymakers throne was wild to see. Did you do any sessions to try and prepare for this race? Because it's, just brutal um and as you said you didn't get to race before how did the body handle just such a big day or maybe it wasn't big for you and i'm misreading that yeah to be honest so nationals was like kind of a side quest i didn't really i wasn't i wasn't even sure i was gonna go until like a few days before um Mm. and i I had it in the back of my mind because nationals the last few years has been in um knoxville and Mm -hmm. it's just one of those courses where it like physical ability doesn't really matter if if a team has 10 guys and you're by yourself you're you're screwed you know you're you're not getting away because it's just a giant freeway um and this year it was obviously a physical course like there's quite a lot of climbing and it's pretty long right so it was like i don't really like my career is only going to be so long. I'd like to win nationals at some point. So like, yeah, if, if I'm in shape and training has gone well for these last, this last month or whatever, then I might as well go. And then like, yeah, worst case scenario, Neil, like, uh, can help Nielsen, uh, yeah, race, but like, ideally we can both be good enough to win. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say I I focused on that race at all. Really, it w- it was more about coming back to Europe and racing. Um, and yeah, to to be honest, it's completely different. It's it's like racing in the U.S. is like there's just no no pressure with like positioning, and at least this is how I find it with like 
it just doesn't feel like a the same energy as a European bike race. And so it's it, I just felt so relaxed there. And it's like, yeah, eventually the the course is gonna like round out who's physically good enough. Mm -hmm. So is it just that people are less aggressive going into the key moments? It seemed like it was two climbs, basically little, little three to five minute efforts, six minute efforts in your, say that race was in Europe. How would it have been different? Yeah, I think there, especially nationals, there's no like team dynamics that yeah. I'd say in, in world tour racing, there's like these high pressure team dynamics where it's like, if you're not the leader on your team, they want to see you do the best possible job you can. And these guys are just like, if their job is to pull from 5k to 100 meters before a climb, they're going to do the best possible job. And there, there's a guy on each team doing that job. So it's just like high stress into the bottom of every climb. And there are just all these like small accelerations all the time throughout the day out of corners I, yeah in the u.s it's just like it seems like more of a i don't know it's just more relaxed the racing what's the let's jump into the training a little bit then that you can share of what is your let's say you're coming you know, into the spring races, what are some sessions that you like to focus on or that your coach is pretty specific about you doing that gets you ready to race? Yeah, well, I, I personally think like everything you need to keep like the volume going and you need to keep touching like the VO2 zone probably weekly. Um, but as you get closer to races, uh, my coach is pretty into like, I don't know, 40, 20s, 30, 30s, like more on off kind of stuff. Um, and we found that gets me, I guess, more of a racing similar stimulus. But the, the other thing is, I think a lot of world tour guys now, they never really go full gaps in training. They just like stay in their zones. They follow their intervals. Um, but I, we found that like, if I don't, if I don't do like a hard climb after a long training period or like, yeah, some full gas kind of effort, I just like mentally can crumble in these races sometimes because it's like, yeah, just, it's like a mental battle going, going full gas. And, and some guys can just do it. Like they're like, oh, it's a race. I'm going full gas. But like, if I haven't pushed myself to the max on the bike in like a month and a half and I get to the race, I just have these crazy intrinsic thoughts about, you know, oh, like what am I doing here when I'm suffering? And it just, uh, it's difficult. So you need that kind of, I wouldn't necessarily call it a race simulation, but just like a full gas effort really helps me before a race. Do you do that on a local climb that you know? Do you just pick wherever you are and do you strive at all and like chase some other pros' times? Or is it just, how do you are, are you not specific with that at all? It's just like, oh, here I am. I'm going to go rip this today. Yeah, it depends. I mean, my like my coach will tell me, oh, like, rip, don't rip this climb. Or yeah, we'll talk about it beforehand. Um, I feel like, yeah, most places I train, there's like a, a certain climb I do efforts up. And then I'll just like one day, a week, a week out from a race, just smack it from the bottom and, uh, try and hang on basically. All right. What's, do you, are you in the gym at all or any strength training, strength and conditioning stuff? Yeah, I'd say mostly in the winter, um, I do like two, three, I guess, gym sessions, but, um, it's not, nothing crazy at all. It's, it's like insanely easy, basically, I would say. It's like minimal reps. And then, uh, yeah, I'd say we do like once a week maintenance throughout the year and sometimes without weight as well, even depending on where I am. So. When you, so some people might hear a few reps and think, oh, well, that means heavy weight. Is it, is it still lightweight? Are you using like dumbbells or what type of exercises are you doing? <laughs> 
Um, it's not like super light, but it's not, I'm never doing anything till failure. Um, okay. I mostly, the only like loading exercises I do are like with the hex bar, like hex bar deadlifts or, um, like with a kettlebell. Um, I forget what they're called. It's like single leg RDLs or something. Or, okay. Uh, like suitcase deadlifts. It's it's all like uh, not super intense, um, and then the rest is all like core slash body weight stuff like planking and uh, yeah, yeah stuff like that. Do you worry at all, or other friends that are climbers? You know, we're talking about weight. Do you worry about adding too much weight, or do you re- is that you're like, hey, the strength gains and keeping myself strong is worth any small amount of weight I might gain. Yeah. I think you're, you're not going to gain enough weight to cause problems. And if, if you gain weight, it's helping you probably produce more power. Um, yeah, but I, I'm lifting such a minimal amount that it's like, there's no way I'll gain weight from that. Mm-hmm. I think I, I could be wrong. Uh, maybe the DEXA scan will disagree, but. Do you get DEXA scanned often? Uh, not all the time, but like it'll tell you if you put on muscle. I guess like maybe twice a year, three times a year. Okay. So what do you? What are some things you're trying to improve on for the rest of the season, or maybe even bigger picture? You know, I don't know how long some athletes have talked about timelines that teams give them. Hey, this is we're in 2024. By 2026, we want to see this. And so then you're maybe talking your coach and saying, geez, to achieve that, I really need to improve on these things. Do you have anything that you can share that you're like, these are my personal goals of getting better? It's really just racing. It's like mm-hmm. uh, um, being able to do the physical performances that theoretically I, I could probably do in training and doing them in a race because I've never come even close. And it's like... Uh, whether that be um, from all the small accelerations or just purely like fatigue resistance after three hours or whatever it is, or mental. Um, I I haven't been able to perform to what my theoretical level is in in a race ever. But, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's just the way I am. Maybe just like two hard accelerations into the base of a climb just drops my power output by 20 percent. but like i don't know so the more i race the more i'm sort of improving but and some races i just have shocker days and it's like what is wrong with me two days ago i did like some really good training efforts and then in the race i was like at 60 percent of my level and it just doesn't make sense sometimes so then I, then I go down these rabbit holes of like, oh, I'm just mentally terrible. I can't suffer on the bike. And that, that can be a bad, a bad place to go to. But um, so I think sometimes it is true. So uh, there's, yeah, just improving in races. Because, yeah, your, your ceiling, obviously, that's what we're trying to improve physically, like, all the time is yeah your your ceiling and then your fatigue resistance but yeah to me i I don't know if it's just like the the answer can't be just lifting my ceiling and then like my worst performances go up a little bit and then i can maybe be competitive in a race no it's more like closing the gap between my best and my worst performances and then i'll be probably more competitive um and then the other thing is like, uh, yeah, I'd like to improve my time trial. It's it's going to be probably a long term project, but um, there's something that just makes me incredibly inefficient. If you look at like my power output in time trials, it's just it's like uh, I go so slow, and I I don't know what it is because I've tried. It's really like I've tried super hard to um, improve my position, but. If you're not going to the wind tunnel and stuff, it's pretty hard to know what's actually faster. So I'd like to work on that, but that's more of a project with the team. Um, and that's probably more of a long-term thing because I, I don't see myself going for GC in the next 
month, you know. Mm -hmm. I love that about closing the gap between the best and the worst versus just raising the ceiling. That's a really good topic. I haven't thought about that difference. It's really interesting. When you brought up fatigue resistance, what is, how do you guys approach that? Is it just doing efforts at the end? Do you go and ride and say, Hey, go burn X amount of KJs and then we're going to do these intervals. Or is it more just looking at your performance in races? And like you mentioned, like certain climbs or efforts, or how do you guys try to gauge that? Yeah. So what's interesting is that it's like I said before, like fatigue resistance can kind of be a few different things. The, the, I guess more common way of looking at it is like, okay, after 4,000 KJs, can you do a 30 minute effort as well as you could in the first hour? But that's never been a problem for me ever. Like, uh, so in theory, I have good fatigue resistance, but then I get in a race. And it's like, it's more just like never, never getting off the pedals, never getting like a full recovery. Because in that 4,000 KJ ride before I did the hard effort, I probably stopped for water twice or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. uh, or stopped at a stoplight, you know? But to me in the racing, it's like, yeah, even in the, in the first 30 minutes when the break is going and the last 30 minutes, I could probably do the same effort. It's still, it's still nowhere close to my ceiling probably just because of like the five to 10 sprints out of corners we're doing all the time when you're in the Peloton. Um, and I think those wear on you a lot more, at least on me. It seems like some other guys have no problem, mm. but for me, that's been the, the hardest thing. And I guess you can kind of simulate that in training, but to me, it's just the racing that, that does that. Um, so it's, it's been, it's been tough to yeah, really try and figure out, but, um, there is for sure some value into doing like, uh, it, doing your efforts under whatever 3000 KJs of fatigue versus fresh. Hmm. I think if you did all your efforts tired, it wouldn't be super productive, but for sure there's some like race simulation aspect that helps. Do you think that could help with the mental side also maybe kind of aligned with this going full gas on a climb, you know, just doing some efforts. So you're remembering, Oh shoot, this is what it feels like when I, even if the numbers are in the same, maybe you're still going full gas tired. Do you find benefit from that kind of along the same, uh, I guess thought process? Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, there's always the mental side to it. Um, and yeah, it just seems to me like so easy to forget how it feels and that, like even day to day at a race like you you go to sleep and you wake up in the morning and you're like oh yeah, i'm gonna get in the breakaway it's gonna be like great and then you get on the climb and attacks are going and oh this is what it feels like <laughs> my legs hurt oh uh, you had made an interesting point before about saying you can kind of go down a mental hole at times and you know i think it's always interesting athletes at your level we now know of some days you're like man i think i kind of suck at this when we're all looking you're like what are you talking about you get crazy what do you what's your tools for getting out of that funk i'd say it's kind of it's kind of different every time um i mean it, they're like okay maybe 10 times an hour at a bike race i'll question myself but that could be really easy to just be like, no, 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 just like, just like one more, one more pedal stroke. And then it goes away. But then there are times where it's been like months at a time. I've been like, I just, I'm not talented or something. And, uh, yeah, that, that's, that can be really hard to get out of. And, uh, you know, we, uh, the team works with sports psychologists. Um, I work with this guy, Barney, and he's, he's been super helpful with that. Um, but a lot of times it's been random stuff like, yeah, talking, talking to friends about it can help seeing where other people are at can help and, and talking about other people's journey. Cause I think a lot of people deal with the same, same stuff, no matter what level you're at, you can feel like an imposter or yeah, you can struggle, um, in all aspects of life. But yeah, at the end of the day, as long as you're trying your best, I think 
for me, that's always made me the happiest. Like, I think in, in this sport, I've often gotten caught up on outcome and been like, yeah, like, why can't I achieve this result? It just really frustrates me. Um, but yeah, I've always been happy if I just give my best with the tools I have on the day, you know? I love that, man. That's a huge tip. As you said, for any cyclist, whatever level, I think that's super helpful for people. You mentioned, was his name Barney, the sports psych? Mm -hmm. What are some things that you carry with you from those sessions that really stick out? Well, he's helped me a lot with uh, mm -hmm. like returning to racing after my crash. Mm -hmm. That helped a lot. Um, because it's something that it's, it's almost impossible not to think about. I mean, you go, you go down like a wet descent at 80 Ks an hour and you just see these guys who, I don't know, maybe they're thinking the same thing as I am, but I look at them riding in front of me and I'm like, this guy has, he does not care about taking risks at all. And, and you're like, I'm following this guy's wheel. If he crashes, I crash. And yeah, he's, he's taught me to kind of like, if, if you recognize that you're experiencing a threat, then you like, you just have to like come back and then think about, okay, I have two decisions. Either I can just like stop the bike race or I can just like focus on these few things like, you know, taking the corner properly, like looking through the corner, uh, pushing on my outside foot. And then, and then it just comes naturally and then you forget about it. But, uh, it's important when that happens to like recognize the threat. So you don't just keep thinking about it with no concrete action. Hmm. I like that. It's interesting. I'm sure those are really interesting sessions to go through and just to probably like look back on your own personal growth. Yeah. You had made an interesting comment. I want to jump back to from before and we kind of just got down another thread, but you had mentioned before the weight loss kind of messing up your training and you sort of smirked a little bit anything you can share on that that you've done that you're thinking what was i why did i do that or and is it your coach that was asking sean what are you doing right now yeah i mean i think so my coach is this guy nate wilson uh i think i've okay. actually had him on the podcast yeah yeah nate was on a great great guy yeah. um He's coached me since I joined EF, but ironically, he, he coached me since I was a junior. Like, uh, I was riding with the national team. He was the U23 director, but he coached a lot of the riders. And I was like, oh, man, this guy seems like a guru. So, um, yeah, I asked him to coach me. And he was coaching me, yeah, for four years before we were on the same team. So it's been interesting because now he's kind of like, uh, my boss, whereas before it was kind of like I was hiring him to coach me. So, um, that's been fun to, yeah, see our relationship change in that way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been an amazing experience. What I was going to say is like nowadays he's very, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do something with weight loss if he, if he didn't sign off on it, you know, <laughs> whereas in the past it's been like i would just do it without telling him because it's it's like oh he's my coach but he's not my nutritionist so like i'm just gonna go do like all of these rides fasted that he has listed so or like only eat protein bars or um <laughs> i don't know i mean there was one time when i was a junior i had never thought about watts per kilo and then my friend went to like a Sunweb camp and he came back and he was like, oh, if you can do this many watts per kilo, you can be a GC rider at a Grand Tour. If you can do this many watts per kilo, you can like win, uh, I have some classic and I was like, huh, I can do that. I just need to lose like 15 pounds. So I'm just going to do that. <laughs> like it's pretty simple. And so I just lost, like, I remember before world champs in Innsbruck, I lost like I think like 20 pounds in two months or something. Whoa. And my training was, it was horrible. I think I lost like a ton of Watts in the, in the process. But, uh, yeah, I was like telling my coach, I was like, oh man, I'm going to fly. 
like it just the the logic was uh was sound right you know like if if i do this many walks and i lose this many kilograms then i'm fine i'm gonna win the race don't worry about it and then yeah i wasn't great um <laughs> and yeah i think i think i've done all sorts of stupid diets um i've tried the low carb thing to me to me it's all nonsense you know and maybe for like a, a normal person who's not a normal person but a person who's not like working out as much as we are some stuff can work but if you're training 20 hours a week with intensity there's yeah no like crazy diet that's gonna help you at all so let's go in and that's a great segue to nutrition what is so it sounds like you're pro carb obviously do you carb load at all for any type of race or do you just yeah just actually how do you approach nutrition yeah. for races i think uh i mean it's it's nothing crazy like maybe the the day before the race i'll do like a, a big calorie surplus but mo almost all days i'm having like enough carbs to theoretically carb load anyways so mm. At least that's what I think. Um, like once you're having a kilogram of carbs on some of these days, when you're, when you're racing, it's like, uh, yeah, you can, like does more than that even help you. It's like, you, you, mm -hmm. you probably had enough. Um, but I think the main thing in racing is like, yeah, replenishing the calories as long as, and yeah, obviously the glycogen, um, and then on the bike, you want to eat a ton. So. What are you doing on the bike for on race day? Oh, let's do like liquids or solids or maybe you're all liquid or how does that break down? Uh, yeah, almost all gels and mix. Um, we have this brand Amax and their gels are super good. Um, they also have some like gummies and bars, but I, I mostly just do gels because yeah, at, at this point it's like, we're racing so hard you don't really have that two hour window where you're just sitting around chatting in the peloton and you're like oh man that food would taste really good right now i really want a speculoos rice cake it's like you don't even think about it you're just like boom take it yeah what's the do you target any amount of carbs per hour or are you eating by just feel or you've done so long that you're like this is time for a gel no, or how does like, that work it's like one yeah like 110 an hour or something like that okay cool um you mentioned kind of it's just being full gas and other pros on different podcasts have just talked about this generation of cycling the racing is just full on um is that pretty accurate like the just it's sometimes hard we don't either on tv we don't always get to see the beginning if it's not like a full race we might only see the last 50k but is it just as intense every race uh these days yeah i mean you see it in all sports it's just evolution like mm. everything gets improved every every rider gets better every team gets smarter and i feel like in the past especially when i was coming up there was kind of like this hierarchy where yeah if you if you weren't experienced, you were like, I can't, I can't do that. I can't like whatever ride for GC at that race. Cause I'm too young. And there was kind of this hierarchy and there wasn't this like constant competition for every single scrap. Whereas now, and maybe there was, and I was just oblivious to it cause I wasn't in the pro peloton, but now it seems like yeah every like i said before every single guy is doing their job to the absolute best that they think that they know they can like i don't know the guy who rides for like taking the dope the guy who rides for bora from kilometer 10 once or 20 once the break's gone until i don't know an hour and a half to go in the race that guy trained perfectly at home that guy has a i don't know massive ftp and that guy is gonna ride as hard as he can for two hours on the front regardless of the breakaway he doesn't care he's just like i'm gonna do my job perfectly 
So we're going 45 K an hour over all these climbs. And like, it, it's just ridiculous. And, uh, this guy's also in the past, he'd probably ride with straight arms upright, give the guy behind him a good draft. Now he's riding like in some crazy arrow position, no CDA arrow helmet, arrow socks, skin suit. Uh, he's taking down 120 grams of carbs an hour. And so we're just flying and it's like, yeah, well, I'm not going to talk to the guy next to me because that would be wasting energy because mm. I'm going to have to go in the wind to talk to my friend. So it's like, well, no, I'd rather just stay in the line with the team because if I don't, then I'm going to have to sprint twice as hard out of every corner and it's going to be just a miserable day. That is a wild perspective and a great job storytelling that, Sean. I love that. It's like very vivid picture. <laughs> A uh, couple things that you mentioned that have come up before. So do most people wear skin suits or like I think some companies call them road suits now. Is anyone wearing bibs and jersey or is it pretty much everything as arrow as possible? I think the bibs and jersey are still pretty arrow at this point. Like okay. or they've gotten pretty arrow. Like my I, I just got a national champ jersey. Uh, they haven't printed the skin suit yet. So I was racing a jersey and bibs, but it's so tight. It's like. I feel like it's basically the same thing. But yeah, we're getting to the the point where like now they give us long sleeve road suits. And it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, we're basically racing in t time trial suits some days if it's if it's cold enough. Um, and I think we're going to see that with more teams. You've seen our team has this like road time trial helmet. Um, Joe Juan Lachlan was wearing at uh, Unbound. And I think every team's going to have one of those in at least two years, maybe. Mm. Yeah, that maybe it's interesting that you bring up the jersey because it, does, it even has like the TT, the collar looked at. I was like, oh, wait, is that a jersey or is that a set? Oh, okay, that's a jersey. Yeah, super fast, everything. What's the kind of some miscellaneous questions? Like when you look at the big picture of your training racing is there anything that really stands out as maybe not the number one thing where you're like, I need to nail this to be my fastest. Yeah, I think, I think the most important thing, I, I would say the most important things you can do in training, like in the sessions are probably, yeah, getting enough zone two and volume in and then doing the vo2 work and if you do that you're like 95 percent the way there as everyone mm. says it seems um but i think the most important part that i've always messed up in the last few or in my whole career is often like also recovering properly because of nutrition and like yeah that's where a good coach comes in like timing it all together tying it tying it all together and uh yeah. What that's uh what is the when you say proper recovery, what comes to mind? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's just like uh if you're doing a big three week block, you need like the time to recover from that into the next race. And it's like more more day to day. It's mm -hmm. like in the past like I said, I would do a massive ride and I'd be like, oh, I just burned 6,000 calories. Time to like let that deficit sink in and like lose a kilogram. Whereas now it's like, no, you need to, you need to match that with a massive meal of rice or whatever afterwards. Mm -hmm. If, if you're going to make the adaptation, because yeah, to make the adaptation, you need the stress, but you also need to recover from the stress. That's that's like the Instagram real clip right there of making the adaptation. I think it's easy to forget that. It's like the training's mm -hmm. one part, but now recover from it. And that's yeah. re a really good thing that you just highlighted. Uh, the zone two and VO2 max is 95%. What's the other 5%? I don't know. I think that's everyone's <laughs> opinion. Uh, uh, what's your opinion? Maybe the racing as you brought up before or... Uh, just something that's yeah, not. Well, I would say racing is a whole different realm, maybe. Like, mm. it, it, yeah, it also really depends what you're training for. I think that's that's the main thing. Like, I say that as a professional road cyclist. Like, if you're training for gravel, 
maybe maybe VO2 is not even the answer. Like, yeah, yeah, it raises your ceiling and maybe it raises your threshold, but like, do you even do you even need a high threshold? Or if you could do ninety percent of your threshold for seven hours, would you be the the best gravel rider in the world? Even if your threshold was thirty watts lower, mm-hmm. so it's it's interesting, um, and I'm sure it's the same with like crit, crit racing. Like I have no idea what makes a, I mean, what makes a good crit racer is probably more the skill set than the physical ability. I mean, you need like anaerobic repeatability, but yeah, I, I don't think I would know exactly what physically makes a good crit racer. Mm. Is there any race that you'd love to win that on paper maybe doesn't quote unquote suit you, but you're like, damn, that would be a sick race to win. Well, I don't really know what suits me. That's, that's the thing. I want to mm-hmm. be a GC rider. I want to compete in Grand Tours one day, but um, yeah, I'm sure there are haters who think like that's not possible. Maybe not haters, but that, yeah, I think a lot of a lot of people have like uh, a bit of a misconception about me. They think I'm like this punchy sprinter or something. That's really not the case. It's like uh, yeah, I'd say my biggest strength is probably long climbs. Um, it's just I've been a bit unproven, and then I have this sprint coincidentally. So like, people just assume I'm like a punchy rider because mm. I have this like five second sprint that's good. So they're like, "Well, this is a perfect race for you." Three minute climbs. And I'm like, "Man, that could not. That's like my kryptonite." Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, like the nationals course. If that was his day, yeah. Now I wouldn't. I mean. The climbs were a little longer if you add like the false flat and stuff, but I think I really would have struggled with that race if it was a, a world tour peloton on that course. Um, mm. The only reason I was able to win is because it's like, yeah, I, it's, a, it's such a, a long day that the American riders just couldn't, uh, yeah, perform for, I guess, 200K. And mm. um, yeah. Yeah, I think some of my amateur friends who were there said the climbs basically played out when you mentioned the false flat it was one of them was uh what do you say like seven watts a kilo and then it kind of flattened out and the other one was just the opposite it was like kind of a drag and then everybody's like full gassing that is that pretty accurate yeah they were basically flipped yeah okay sounded brutal so one was one was a lot steeper and more i think the first climb was way harder Okay. Interesting. What's in sort of thinking about when you're trying to figure out yourself as a rider, um, in that article I was referencing before on EF that you talked about kind of gaining perspective and realizing, okay, I'm at the world tour. Now I need to figure myself out, but this success is going to take time. Can you add to that? Like, is this also, you've, you've made so many good comments about this, but I guess directly asking, is it just being in that world tour arena where everyone is so damn good. You've talked about how, you know, this guy who's riding for the hour and a half from 10 K until the catch is made, he's doing his job so well, sort of like, what else did I miss anything from like, when you mentioned gaining perspective that you're just trying to like six, how to succeed in this uh, arena that you're in. Yeah. I mean, part of it probably comes down to not overthinking it because if, mm. if you go down that rabbit hole and you're like, man, like even even the guy who doesn't care about this race at all and he just wants to do his best two hours on the front and then sit up and like whatever, just like hope his his leader won. Um, yeah, you, if you think that even that guy is so good, then it's it's just so hard to to be like positive about it i think if you look around you you see these guys you watched on tv growing up and you're like wow like uh, i don't know how i'm like yeah of course i'm not doing well at these races these guys are so so good but um i think if you don't overthink it and you just say like okay i want to win a stage at this race i don't care who's there i'm just going to do my best in training do what my director tells me to do get in position at this corner and then yeah, of course, like it's easy. It's simple. I'll just win the race. So mm. it's like 
you can't overthink it sometimes. Um, and yeah, I guess I feel like I've gained perspective on that, but it's, it's almost like at first I came into the world tour and I was just like, oh, it's simple. I'm just going to go win all these races because I'm good. But then I started realizing like, oh man, when I wasn't doing as well, like the Dauphiné, my first year pro was like the first race. I came in and the team was like, we're going to like work for you in these three, four stages. Um, and I got third on the first stage and it seemed so easy. It was just like, oh, I just got in position and like, it was fine. And then like the second day well, it didn't go as well. And then we got to the mountains and I just got destroyed. And it was like, I looked around at who I was racing against and I was like, wow, like these guys are all really good. I, I am a bit over my head here thinking it's so easy. And, um, yeah, I think then I started going down the other way and being like, oh, I don't know if I am that good. And how it's kind of like seeing the perspective of both sides, appreciating the competition, but also fo focusing on yourself so you can succeed. Mm, I love that, man. And that's, I think if I, something that I've just in reading about you and from talking to you today, it's like really focus on yourself, go in your dojo, work on yourself, put in the reps, and then just let things unfold. And I think it's a really good message because for even, you know, I, I like that you've made a lot of references to, hey, this might help the amateur cyclist. People that find cycling that are just trying to improve and find joy through the sport who are never going to come close to your level. But it's like they have their own little microcosm of trying to grow as an athlete. And I think you've given so many really good gems for everybody to take. And I really appreciate that. Um, so I guess my last question for you is what, any for maybe the junior or the person who has been following you and says, damn, I want to get to that level. Looking back from all that you've already been through and you're still so young, what's what's a tip or two that you would give them just to try and maybe stay focused on the path ahead? Um, I would say a couple things. The first one is like, sit down and think about how bad you actually want. That might sound a little cliche, but like sit down and think about how much you're willing to give if it doesn't like if it doesn't end up the way you want it are you still mm. going to be happy that you tried like a lot of guys will say i want to be a pro cyclist not a lot of guys are willing to say i want to be a, a pro cyclist even if i never make it and i i like spend five years racing in french amateurs and it doesn't work out even, even if that happens, I still want to try. So I think, yeah, if you're a junior, you, you need to sit down and be honest. Like, yeah, you probably wouldn't want to win the Tour de France, but do you want to like do everything you can to try and achieve that with, with the chance that it fits? And, um, that's true passion if you can if you can answer that question and say yeah yeah i'm willing to put in all this work no matter like if if i never even get close like i still want to try um because a lot of people and and this has happened to me before as well a lot of people get caught in the, on the way up like uh yeah results don't go your way and you're just like oh i'm gonna retire i'm gonna I don't know, whatever, do this because like, I'm not good enough. Whereas in reality, even just like a minor setback. And I think a lot of guys lose momentum because of certain things that are a bit more trivial than they realize. And yeah, I think if you have the true passion, um, I, I believe a lot of people can get further than they think. Um, and then, yeah, the second thing is just like consistency. I think they, they tie together. Like it's something I see a lot of young guys, if they don't get selected for this race, they're like, oh, well now I can't win that race. So I can't go to that team. So I can't um, go to that team the next year and <laughs> they go down this spiral and it's like, 
everything relies on this next race. And then when it goes south because they crash or they get sick or even they're just not good enough, they just like check out for three months and they don't train or they don't try. And then they lose all this time where they could have been improving. Um, and it, it, you don't get time back. Um, so I'd say consistency. That's something I've, I've made, like, I'll call myself, I've, I've made that error before. It's like, oh, I got sick at my goal race for the year. So now I'm just like, I don't care anymore for the next four months. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm going to wait till next year and then try and come back and win this race again. But it's like, well, how much, how much could I have improved in those four months? Probably a lot. But instead I was just like moping about because, because it went south. So. Man, uh, the way you articulate some of these answers, I think I've always thought of consistency as the word, but you said momentum and that is powerful and don't that's lose a, the that's momentum. That's a big Nate Wilson term as well. Oh, real? Okay. Shout out, Nate. Yep. If people haven't heard that podcast, that was a good one with Sean's coach. Really good. Yo, man, this is uh, actually the always the last question. So we connect on Instagram. I'll put your profile there. Do you blog or TikTok or tweet or Strava? Where can other people follow along with you this year? Not really. I mean, I'm pretty quiet on social media. I think it's sometimes a bad addiction. But um, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram. I, all my stuff goes to Strava. Um, I'm not really active on there, but you can see what my training is. Creeping like a ninja. I like it. Sean, thank you so much for doing this. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. Hit him up on IG. You might see some posts here and there. We'll be fingers crossed for the tour. Uh, everybody, good luck with your training and racing, and we'll talk to you soon.